cause of suffering is ignorance. The word for ignorance, avicca, is the opposite of vicca, which means not only knowledge but also skill. <laughs> So to go past suffering, we need to learn skills. This is an important point to keep in mind. We're not simply sitting here waiting for things to happen. We're trying to approach each breath in a skillful way. Approach all our activities in a skillful way. When the mind settles down, it's because we've developed a skill. And then as we look at that skill and understand it, that's what gives rise to discernment. So when things aren't going well in the meditation, ask yourself, what are you doing that's not skillful? Maybe in the way you breathe, or maybe in the way you approach the breath, or maybe in the attitude that you bring to the practice. But learn to see all these issues as questions of skill. And try to bring to the practice the same attitudes you would bring to any kind of skill you develop in your life. This is why some meditation masters ask you to develop a manual skill before you meditate, because you develop a lot of good attitudes. There's a certain amount of patience, a certain amount of equanimity that's required in order to master a skill. In our modern society, a lot of skills are being lost, which means that many of us don't have the, the proper attitudes we need, the proper mental skills we need in order to sit down and meditate and do it well. So try to think back on whatever skills you've developed, maybe in learning a musical instrument, learning a sport learning a craft of some kind. And try to bring them to the practice. Part of this means having a desire but knowing how to relate to your desire. In other words, you want to do this well. You want to get good results. But you realize, if you have any skill at all, that if you want good results, you have to make the causes good, too. So that's where you focus your desire. We want the mind to settle down. How do you get it to settle down? You just keep it with a breath. So keep coming back to the breath. As soon as you find that you've wandered off, come back, come back, come back. And any chattering voices in the mind speak in tones of discouragement or boredom or whatever, you've got to learn how to put those aside. You can't identify with them. And then as you stay with the breath, how can you stay in a way that's skillful, that you're not putting too much pressure? In different parts of the body, you're not trying to stifle the breath. As you focus in on it, because you do want the, the focus of your concentration to be strong and steady, but you don't want it to be so heavy that it becomes constricting. So this is a matter of watching yourself, learning how to step back from what you're doing. and judge it with a certain amount of equanimity and patience. There was a famous teacher in Thailand who had a lot of Western students, and he realized that these were the two qualities that they were most lacking in, again, probably because they didn't have many skills, but also because they were lacking in two really important skills, areas where we don't tend to think of them as being skills, the skills of generosity and the skills of virtue. Because these two teach patience, and they teach a lot of good attitudes that you're going to need as you meditate. The skill of generosity comes from realizing that your happiness can't depend on your eating alone. There's a happiness that comes from sharing, and in sharing you, you realize that you don't have to follow in with your desires. You can say no to your greed. You can say no to your possessiveness. This is especially true when you've given something, not because it was the holiday where people give things or you were under compulsion to give, but you just felt like giving. You, 
you saw, saw something you had, someone else could use it well, would benefit from it, you wanted to share. That's a skillful attitude, because it helps you realize that there's a happiness that comes in letting go. Happiness that comes in thinking about other people's needs, because the happiness we're trying to work on as we meditate is a happiness that's blameless, that doesn't cause any harm to anyone. And when you're generous, you begin to realize that your happiness has to include the happiness of others as well. At the very least, you want to be able to share with them. That cuts down the boundaries between you and those other people, it makes it a lot easier to live together. And this way you develop a certain skillfulness in your relationships with others. You take long-term consequences into account. You learn how to say no to your more selfish desires. These are important skills. And they require learning how to talk to yourself in such a way that you're happy to give. This skillful voice that you can create, or these skillful voices you can create in the mind, are going to be really helpful as you meditate. Even more so with the skills of virtue, because in each case, not killing, not stealing, not having illicit sex, not lying, not taking intoxicants, you have to think of it as a matter of learning how to live skillfully, find happiness in a skillful way. If you simply act on your impulse without thinking about consequences, there are going to be problems down the line. And if you're the type of person who breaks the precepts easily, it's going to get in the way of your meditation in many ways. One is that you tend not to want to look at your intentions, and you don't want to look at the results of your actions. You don't like even being told that there's a more skillful way to live. There's a certain willfulness in saying, well, this is the way I do things, and I don't want to be told any other way at all. That closes the door. And part of you knows that what you've been doing is unskillful, and so you try to bury it in denial. And that's not creating the conditions for any kind of insight at all. Things are being closed off and buried up in your mind. So when there's the impulse to kill, even if it's a case where you, you feel that you're in danger or someone you love is in danger, you have to remind yourself there are other options. Or even if it's something like dealing with the issue of termites, once you've decided that you're going to make the vow to yourself that you're not going to harm anybody, you're not going to kill anybody, you've got to think about how you build your house or what kind of house you're going to be willing to live in. In other words, you have to plan ahead. It's not like you take the vow and then suddenly discover down the line, oh, there's such a thing as termites in this world. You know there are termites in the world, so you have to prepare. This willingness to prepare, to go out of your way in order to stick with your vow, to think about the consequences of your actions beforehand. Those are important mental attitudes, important mental skills that you're going to need as a meditator. The same with stealing. If you're the type of person who says, well, taking a little of this, a little of that doesn't really matter. They're not going to miss it. Or Those corporations have been stealing from the rest of the world, so it doesn't matter if I take a little bit from them. That's developing a very sloppy attitude. What they do is their business. Your business is making sure that you're not infringing on things that other people lay hold of. And again, you learn how to realize, okay, you don't need that thing, probably. So why infringe on other people? Similar principle with illicit sex. 
it's primarily de defined as having an affair with someone or having a relationship with somebody on whom someone else already lays claim. Either they're married or they're going steady. Or in the case of minors, the parents lay claims on their children. You stay away from that because you realize it's going to cause a lot of trouble down the line. You learn how to find alternative ways of finding pleasure. It's one of the reasons why we meditate, is to get a sense of well-being inside, so that the strong urge to just give in to an impulse, it's not quite so strong, it's not so, quite so hungry. You can create a sense of well-being here inside. Probably of all the precepts, the one that requires the most discernment and the most ingenuity is the one against lying. It's so easy when you want to avoid talking about something just to say a little white lie and justify it to yourself. But when you set up the rule to yourself that you're not going to misrepresent the truth at all, then the question becomes if it's something that really would be harmful to talk about. And the Buddha recognizes there are some things that when you talk about them give rise to greed, aversion, and delusion, either in yourself or in others. You want to avoid that. You've got to develop the skills needed to avoid certain topics of conversation. Or when someone raises a question, how can you deftly get around it? So you don't have to speak in ways that are going to give rise to unskillful mental states. What this does is it teaches you to be meticulous, scrupulous, use your ingenuity, all of which are a craftsman's skills, and all of which are the skills you're going to need to meditate. As for the precept against taking drugs or alcohol, you have to ask yourself, why? Why do you need to make yourself even more intoxicated than you already are? As the Buddha said, we're intoxicated with youth, we're intoxicated with health, we're intoxicated with life. Those who have wealth are intoxicated with their wealth. Those who have status or power are intoxicated with their status or power. Those with beauty are intoxicated with their beauty. And there's always something for us already to be intoxicated with, and so why compound the problem? Because intoxicants, by their nature, make it very hard to be scrupulous and meticulous. You're destroying part of the intelligence you've worked so hard to develop as a human being. This too is an attitude that a craftsman has. You work on skills, you work on abilities, and you don't want to destroy the ones that you've worked so hard to develop. So when you approach the issue of virtue as a skill, or as a series of skills. It helps to develop the right attitudes, the right inner voices, the ones that learn how to say no in an effective way. The ones that can encourage you and give you a sense of gladness over the fact that you have virtue. In other words, the virtue is not just a hard taskmaster that's going to come down with a whip or come down with a stick. You know how to encourage yourself to see the value of being virtuous, to see the goodness, the sense of well-being that comes from knowing that you haven't acted in ways that are harmful to yourself or harmful to others. Those are parts of your inner personality that are really worth developing. Those two are skills, the ability to talk to yourself into doing something skillful and out of doing something unskillful. That's one of the prime inner mental skills that you're going to need to develop, and you're especially going to need them in the meditation. So these are the skills that the Buddha has you develop as you approach meditation, the skills of generosity, the skills of virtue. When you see them as skills and not just rules that are laid down, you can see how they really do connect with a practice. 
provide a much better environment. Your relationships with other people are more peaceful. It's easier to have the time to meditate. And you've got the right inner attitude of patience, equanimity. The ability to see the, the value of trading in an immediate pleasure for a much longer term pleasure. All of which are skills that will take you a far way.